Okay, well, hello Kiev, and thank you all for staying for not so, such a last talk, but still, thank you for staying. Uh, my name is Damir, and I will be talking today about presenting today a tool belt of a seasoned bug hunter. Um, essentially, we're going to go through a story of how I debugged one really complicated scenario and what were all the tools that I have used in the process because I, I think there, are, there is a value in all of them. So if you let me, I'm just going to say a few words about myself. I am a remote developer. I am working from home. And I subscribe to per programming. Basically, I have a cat sitting on my table. She purrs while I program. Pretty nice. <clears throat> so in all seriousness, while coding and developing applications, I've seen some horrible stuff, like unclosed parentheses. Really bad. But I've also seen bugs. And I've seen different variations of bugs. I've seen bad bugs. You know, those that crash application, deletes data. And well, I've, I've made a few of them myself. Then there are not so bad bugs, you know, something that feel, makes you feel embarrassed, but it doesn't cause a lot of issues. However, second, a different way to speak about bugs is to speak about loud bugs. So something crashes your application, it's usually pretty easy to see what crashed the application. Oh, I call this method of nil. Okay, so let's just ignore that nil and everything will be fine. However, a much worse kind of a bug is a silent bug. You know, it's creeping somewhere in the background, doing some stuff, and you have no idea that it's there until, until it escalated to a bigger level. And this story is about a hunt for a silent bug. Although that's not how I named my story. I named my story 2016, A Debugging Odyssey. So, like a space odyssey, this one begins with monolith, but we'll get to monolith soon. It begins actually by, by, um, with my CTO coming into my room, banging loudly and saying, there is a bug, fix it. Well, actually, that was a long post on Slack explaining uh, actually what happens, and which was quite a good point, uh, starting point for debugging. I have a, a reasonable starting point to think about how I can reproduce this bug. So first step, first chapter of the debugging process is trying to reproduce it and see, see it on my own machine because only then I can afterwards be sure that it is fixed, right? So that is what I'm tr I try to do. I try to do it in multiple ways and eventually one succeed. But the story wouldn't be so interesting if I didn't tell you what the bug was. So actually what is happening is, well, we are developing a monolithic Rails application, of course, and we have a bunch of tests, some of them unit tests, some of them integrational slash functional tests, some of them features, and so on. So based, and because that's a big monolithic application, of course we need something to speed our tests when running them locally, and we use Spring. How many of you know what Spring is? Okay, great. So basically, Spring sits in memory with a Rails application loaded, and when you start your test, it simply uses that application that is already loaded to run your tests quickly. But what happened in our case is that Spring sits, you ask it to run tests, and first time it goes smoothly. Second time, it also goes smoothly. Third time, there is some delay. Fourth time, there is even bigger delay between when you start specs and when they start, before they start running. Uh, fifth time, the delay is double the last time, and so it goes on and on. So reproducing basically was uh, trying to run one test five times and seeing that every single time it's slower than the previous one, and actually it was even easy to reproduce it with a simple one-line bash script that simply <clears throat> in a for loop runs one test. So success, chapter one is complete. And then chapter two typically is well, okay, we have a bug. Since when do we have a bug? Because if we can pinpoint a single point in time, a single commit, then it's actually pretty easy to understand, read that commit, that piece of code that introduced the bug, and find what it introduced it, and work around that, or simply remove it. And typical tool to use for this is to use git bisect. Now, I, how many of you already know how Git bisect works and what it is. 
OK, then I'm really happy that for the rest of you, I have a few slides. So let's consider an objective linear progression of commits for simplicity. So on the right-hand side, we have commit, which contains bug. We'll mark it as a bad commit. On the right-hand side, we have a green commit, seven commits ago, for instance, and it's good. We know for sure that there is no, no bug in that commit. So what, what Git bisect does is, well, what you do as a developer, you mark one commit as bad, you mark one commit as good, and then define a script that will basically be ran on, every, on almost every commit in succession to verify if that, bug, if that commit contains a bug or not. However, Git bisect is smart in that it uses uh, in that, that it uses, sorry, too fast, that it uses a binary search to find a bad commit. So basically, it immediately jumps to, the, to a commit in the middle and tests it. If that commit fails, then we know for sure that that commit is bad, and every commit afterwards is, of course, bad as well. So then we proceed. We select another commit in the middle between good and bad. We test it. It's green. That's good, so now that is the last known good commit. And the process continues. Now we just need to check what's up with this FF. And, you know, I'll leave this as a cliffhanger. <laughs> Rimshot monkey isn't used. A uh, big thing with git commit is that every commit in this succession must be stable. So in order for your test to work, that test must pass on every good commit and must fail on every bad commit. So if you have a commit that pushed some code, that added some commits to master branch, for example, and that commit is, does not contain your bug, but for example, it made other tests fail because it was incomplete, then git bisect may not work for you that well. So a precondition for being able to use bisect is a good engineering process that ensures that every single commit must be healthy, you know, that it does not break the application. Hopefully, your process is already like that. For example, if you're using GitHub and pull requests, then maybe you want to squash your uh, old commits inside a pull request into one commit and merge it, and not have commits like write code, fix tests, and so on, because if you have a commit that just adds new code without fixing tests, then it probably will fail at one point with bisect. But then we get to another problem. Which commit is good? You know, to start by section, you need to find at least this one good commit. And I try to do it manually. So I go back a few days ago. No, it's still slow. Go back two days ago. No, it's still slow. Well, OK, I, I apparently can do this ind indefinitely. So I do as any good Rubyist would do. I write a script, find slow.rb. The script goes basically a commit by commit or day by day. I eventually had to go week by week and month by month, and tests a random commit like from a month ago, checks if it is slow, and if it is not, goes back another month. And then when I finally have a bad commit, I can figure out, <clears throat> I can then start using bisect. And that approach actually helped. I found a commit that introduced monolith. And Monolith is an internal framework we use in our application, which helps us write monolithic Rails applications. One day we will open source it, I promise. Uh, this bug is fixed, so it, it, it's good for public now. The problem is Monolith is huge, the internal framework, as you can imagine. We have Rails framework, and then we have an internal framework built on top of Rails. Yeah, so. That commit was not so easy to read through and just understand, oh, this is the bug. So we're not really sure about this one. OK, so then we go to next chapter, brainstorming. What could it be? So we have something that in increases the time of reloading code. What could it be? Maybe a memory leak. Maybe we're leaking something, and then for some reason, because we have more objects in memory every time, uh, we we do things slower. So, OK, let's experiment with memory leaks. Um, to experiment, we need to set a hypothesis. So a hypothesis is, we have a memory leak. Let's prove the hypothesis. 
Uh, and to prove or disprove memory leaks in, in any programming language, basically, uh, you have few tools. Right. Uh, one tool is heap dump. Heap dump is basically a way to um, get a list of all objects, a dump, that you have in your heap memory, basically in your dynamic memory. And then extract those objects into a text file and read through text file to see what's in your memory and if, if there is too much of something. And this snippet is basically how you would, uh, uh, how you would uh, generate a heap dump in Ruby. Basically, it's already built in. You have object space uh, class. On it, you call trace object allocation start. And from this point on, Ruby will trace every object it allocated inside heap. So for example, then you write some code that you want to check in memory. After that, you write the, <coughs> you create a file into which you will dump all the objects, call dump all, and that's it. As you can imagine, there is a tiny, tiny bit problem with heap dumps. They are huge. Like we have 33,000 lines in memory. So basically that means we have 33,000 objects in memory. So yeah, that, <clears throat> that's not so good. And, and this is not our Rails application, by the way, which was huge. This is just this snippet of code. So this snippet of code, defining a class, defining a method inside a class, printing out string, creating that class, calling a method creates 33,000 thousand objects in memory in Ruby. Ruby is lovely, right? How can, it be, how can we make it three times faster? Well, maybe by not generating 33,000 objects. And this is essentially what the file looks like. Of course, I don't expect you to read it. Um, so uh, this is, so I basically extracted a single line of that file. A single line is a JSON object, and the whole file is a list of JSON objects, one, one per line. And those objects contain uh, interesting things like what is the type of the object, what is the byte size in memory. For some uh, simple literal objects, we can even read the value, and coding even for strings. And generation. Generations, in, generations is interesting. Generation tells us how many uh, garbage collection cycles have run, uh, have run uh, before we dumped this object from memory. Basically, how many generations of garbage collections this object survived. So for example, this string, hello world, in that small example, already survived 13 generations of garbage collection. So apparently I'm not gonna get any help by just reading that file, so I need more tools. One of those tools is Heapy. Heapy is, again, a Ruby script someone wrote and then published as a gem that simply parses that uh, heap dump and extract some interesting values from them, like which, what are the objects that survived the most garbage collection cycles, because that tells you that those project objects have probably leaked. So, but even with that, op with um, Heapify, it, it's not even easy to see what the problem is, because we don't have a problem once, we have a problem that recurs more and more after we restart the application. So I, then I had to write another script, which is an uh, analyze heapy diffs, which basically means, okay, I reload code once, I get the diff, reload code second time, I get heapy, um, heapy report of the dump, third time, get third heapy dump, and then I analyze the diff between those. Still, now I actually started seeing something, but I don't believe what I'm seeing because I see that class DSL objects survive the longest. So does that mean uh, we have a heap dump? Uh, sorry, does it mean we have a memory leak or maybe it's just memory bloating that, is, that is, exists in Ruby? Because I'm not sure if you're familiar with how memory management works in Ruby, but basically Ruby never releases its memory back to the operating system. So if you create one I don't know, if, if Ruby process takes two terabytes of memory, uh, it will keep it to itself. Maybe that memory will not, be, uh, will not be full, it won't contain any useful data, and if Ruby ever again needs to use those two terabytes of data, it will reuse it, but it will never give it back to the operating system. That's an interesting quirk, and that is what makes it very hard to identify a memory leak in Ruby. 
So, you know, I'm still not sure what's going on, and I I'm really not sure if that should be so complicated. So, proving and disproving the initial hypothesis that there is a memory leak doesn't work. I'm, I'm still not sure. So, another brainstorming. Um, let's trace the call stack. How hard could that be to see just which method is called after which method, inside which method? And to do that, we have flame graphs. Micha knows yeah. much more about that, and he presented. Did you present it in Kiev? Yeah. In Kiev, yeah. So a few years ago, maybe you have heard Micha talking about flame graphs. So apparently, they are very popular in our company. Um, flame graph is basically a visualization of call stack. So on the bottom layer, and on the bottom line, you have a function that was called initially. And then that function called another function that called another function. And this is basically, so y-axis is time. And x-axis is the number of calls that a function has made. Um, and, and then on the bottom, you can see how those functions are grouped by gems. Uh, there, there are a few configurations you can do to differently group things, differently colorize them, but this is essentially a flame graph of Rails application start. And because it's so huge and hard to see and analyze, I'm just going to use a simpler example for w what I've seen on, on, top, on top of this graph, like in, uh, in peaks like here. So what I've seen is that if I generate a flame graph on first run, let's assume it looks like this. Then if I generate a flame graph on the second run, I see that there is basically just one method on top that takes now much more time to run. If I generate a third uh, uh, flame graph, that method still takes longer to run. And that actually helped me pinpoint which method was problematic. Um, which is a su success. Now I, I know that method is slow, so let's somehow optimize it. Of course, um, was inside Rails internals that was calling a Ruby method with, to which I don't have an access. So, okay, the problem is obviously not right there, but something is causing it. So, to cut this chase, I have to explain the problem. So, every time Rails parses your routes file, it goes through every single route. And for every route, it generates two methods. One method that will help you generate the URL to your path, and one method that will generate the path to, to that path. Yeah, it, it's a bit clunky, sorry. So, and then of course you have your controllers. And as you know, every controller and every view object in Rails has access to those URL helpers and path helpers. So how, how does Rails do it? Uh, Rails actually has internally two modules. One is path helpers, the other one is URL helpers. So it reads uh, one route definition and then it generates two methods. One it puts into the uh, path helper, the other it puts into the URL, URL helper. And then every time a new controller is initialized, it includes those two modules into every controller, into the generated controller. So if you have a typical Rails application that has, I don't know, 100 controllers, let's say, then you have those, um, those two modules included into 100 controllers, which is fine. However, it's interesting what happens when your code is reloaded. When your code is reloaded, Rails has to reread the routes file. And then if routes file has changed, Rails, of course, has to update all those helper methods. And you probably know that in Ruby, we don't have something like uninclude module. You cannot take a class and remove a module that you already included there. So what Rails does is it generates those two new modules. It drops the old ones. And then for every method in, so actually, sorry, it doesn't drop them. It takes all uh, those old modules. It has it, of course, already. It goes through every method that was in that module, through all the controllers you have in your application, and then removes method one by one. So if you had 100 controllers and two modules, and if you had, for example, I don't know, let's say 300 routes, Rails has to remove uh, 600 methods from 100 controllers. Now, because we had an internal framework, and because we have you know, patched Rails in really interesting ways, 
uh, every time routes file was reloaded, we would actually dynamically generate a new controller. Not one, not two. In the beginning, we, we generated 10 controllers. Uh, after a while, we were adopting the framework more and more, so we generated 20 controllers, 30 controllers, 100 controllers. So basically, at the time we noticed that the application was slow, we were already generating, I don't know, 100 or 200 controllers on every route refresh. And the thing with Rails, it's not really respectful to your memory. So those controllers were not garbage collected. They were sitting there, and every time Rails would read routes file, it would generate a new batch of controllers, include those two helpers into those two controllers, and you remember those 200 controllers from the last run? Well, it would remove the methods from them and add methods to them again. So basically, on every, time, every code reload, Rails had more and more code to remove and then add more controllers to which it would add. It was... Uh, I think the proper word for this is clusterfuck. You know, like those tiny few fuck-ups that add up and suddenly everything breaks. So yeah, this was a situation we have experienced. Internal framework creates controllers, classes created by routing don't get destroyed, and router removes method from all controllers. Bam, 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 exponential growth in time as you try to run your tests. Now let's fix it, right? So. The, the fix was, I, I was expecting, you know, you know, the harder the bug is, the harder it is to find, the easier it must be to fix, right? You just change one line of code and suddenly everything is fast again. Yeah, actually it took me about two weeks, I think, of pair programming with other people smarter than me or using some as rubber ducks to, to actually find a way how to do it. And part of it was basically rewriting the way we hook up this internal framework of ours into into Rails ecosystem. Basically, what we, what we did previously was to specify classes by constants inside routes. So, and that forced uh, Rails to, to read route files, to load those files, and then keep them, keep, them in, keep them in memory. What we fixed was to specify classes by their names or identifiers with strings or symbols, and then we wouldn't need to load all those all those uh, classes to memory immediately as we read file, and that helped us not collect so, so much garbage in our memory space. And now, unrelated to the rest of the talk, the other day I found another place in Rails that helps us lose memory. Uh, basically, fun fact for all of you who are working with Rails, every time you initialize a new object in Rails, sorry, every time you initialize a new class in Rails, a Rails will keep that class in memory, not allowing it to be garbage collected. So, and you know, uh, you can generate classes in Ruby very easily. You just do class.new and specify the class, the inheritance class for it. And what Rails will do is take that class, put it into a hash, and as a value of that hash, it will put all classes that inherit from that, just so that it can look up uh, descendants of, of every class very quickly. So yeah, doing that in dynamic programming language is not nice. So even Rails, you know, written with Ruby in mind, using all the of Ruby, uh, still fails to work well, given the constraint of the, of, of the language being so dynamic and giving you so many freedoms. So I guess the big takeaway point from this is watch out what you're doing with dynamic languages when you're using frameworks. And here I have to, you know, tying back to Marek's presentation, understanding is actually the key. So, and all the story is not as much story of debugging as much a story of understanding the framework on top of which we were working, understanding the framework that we built ourselves, because, you know, uh, there are, we, are, we are developing very complex systems, and with very complex systems there are so many ways in which we cannot predict what will happen when we add a new line of code, and that is what makes debugging a necessity and, well, an art form in itself. So on that topic, I think I'm going to wrap up. Uh, thank you very much for your attention, and I'm, I would be happy to answer any questions you may have. 
Oh, by the way. And I work in TopTal where we have really interesting technical problems. So, you know, if, you'll enjoy, if you enjoy solving complex technical problems, come to us. We have fun for you. Yeah, questions, please. Uh, yeah, just by my eyes. It, it was already the desperate moment because this graph actually is generated by uh, FlameGraph Jam, and FlameGraph Jam, uh, Jam uh, generates SVG files, and then you open an SVG file in browser. And if you don't have enough memory and very fast processor, if you open that uh, FlameGraph in your in Chrome, Chrome crashes. Yeah, yeah oh, open them in Safari. Safari works fine. So. You know, I, I have multi-megabyte SVG files on my desktop, and at one point I just realized, okay, well, let me open three of them and see if it works. I opened three of them in three different tabs, and then I went from tab to tab, and I realized, oh, wow, this part is getting wider and wider. What is happening there? And then, you know, the method is uh, remove modules. Oh, well, how, how do I fix that now? <laughs> so, yeah, co combination of luck and and not knowing what to do next. <laughs> okay, seems no, like no more questions. I will be around if you have any other thoughts on your mind. Thank you very much.